I would like to share something very personal with you, something that's very dear to me. And it is my DNA. This is my ancestry composition according to my genes. As you can see, I'm Italian. And so I was wondering why I felt so comfortable here in Rome, but now I know. But what's most, more remarkable about this is I was able to send a saliva sample to a company, pay $99 and have my DNA analyzed. Pretty incredible. And this was possible because of decades of hard work by basic researchers, starting with the discovery of DNA in 1953. But also because entrepreneurs and business people took this great research and turned it into a product we all can buy today. So to all of you, the researchers, the business people, and everyone involved who made this possible, thank you. Because you allowed me to find out who I truly am. Un italiano vero. So it's great to be home here in Rome and have the privilege to share with you my experience after having spent about half of my life in the United States after leaving Europe. And I'd like to share a story about a meeting I recently had with a Caltech professor. His name is Maury, and Maury is a very prominent faculty member and also a very prolific inventor. And Maury wanted to tell me about two phone calls he received from a friend of his by the name of Steve. And Steve wanted to tell Maury that his mother-in-law was about to get an implant in her eye to treat her for glaucoma, a, a disease that can lead to blindness. And it turns out that the inventions behind the implant was invented by Maury more than 10 years ago. And this is the tiny implant that you see here. So Steve said, Maury, I, my mother-in-law is getting this implant, your implant, and I hope it works. Because if it doesn't, my wife is going to be very upset. So you can imagine the pressure that poor Maury felt at that moment. And then the second phone call came, and it went something like this. Maury, I love you. The implant is working beautifully. My mother-in-law's life has been changed. And more importantly, my wife is very happy. And when Maury was telling me the story, I could see that he was moved, very touched. And he turned to me and said, Fred, that, this is what it's all about. After decades of researching the hardest problems, one of my ideas is making people's lives better. And there's nothing more rewarding than that. So basic research can have what I call direct societal impact. Obviously, it can. And there's many examples of that. Look at the discovery of the positron that led to the invention of the PET scanner, a key diagnostic tool for cancer and heart disease. Or look at the discovery of, DNA, of the structure of DNA. It led to the invention of the automated DNA sequencer, which enabled the Human Genome Project and laid the foundations for personalized medicines. Two great examples of basic research, helping people. But impact is well beyond that. Think about all the great jobs created in the process. New companies were launched. Entire new industries were established. Think about the economic growth generated by these discoveries. So the impact of basic research can be enormous, truly enormous. And the question I would like to ask is, are we all doing everything we can to ensure that basic research realizes its full potential of making the world a better place? And by all, I mean the researchers, the business people, the general public, the government, the investors, everyone. When I uh, first moved from Europe to Caltech as an engineering student in 1991, Caltech was very much the same place that it is now, but at the same time was a very different place. 
By the way, that's me walking on the campus 25 years ago, very serious student with my briefcase. Caltech was the same place because, like then and now, we are primarily concerned with the relentless pursuit of the fundamental understanding of nature. Basic research is our main driver. But it's also very different because now, unlike 25 years ago, we also care a lot about the impact of our research in society. And further, we have embraced the idea of being proactive about bringing our discoveries to the public for their benefit. And that was quite a transformation. So how did it happen? Well, the first step was, and that's the most crucial and controversial for academics, was to accept the idea if we wanted to bring our discoveries to people through new products, we had to partner with industry. Universities are in the knowledge business, research and education, not making and selling products. That's what industry is good at. So in order for us to have societal impact, we have to partner with the business world. The second step was to hire people to act as the interface between researchers and business people. People whose job it is to facilitate the interactions between the two. People who are negotiators, deal makers, and relationship brokers. And by the way, I was one of these people when I first started working at Caltech, 10 years after starting as a student in this new job here. And the third step was for us, the relationship brokers, to build trust with faculty. To go out to them and explain that we're here to support them in their commercialization activities. People who, and one faculty at a time, the culture starting to change. And when the culture starts changing, you know that you're in for a big transformation. And the consequences of this culture change were almost immediate. Researchers started telling us about their ideas much more enthusiastically than ever before. We jumped from a thir 36 inventions per year to 172 in just a very short time. Pretty remarkable. And obviously, having the researchers disclose your inventions is key. Without that, you don't have the raw material, the, the seeds have the potential to turn into breakthrough technologies. So that's critical. But it's hardly sufficient. That's only the beginning of the process. And when I first started my job at Caltech, I thought, this is a great place. There's technologies that are amazing everywhere in all labs. So I'm going to go in the labs, grab them te these technologies, package them, make a few phone calls to industry, and within a few months, I will have products out there selling in the marketplace and changing people's lives. Well, it's not the way it works. And I didn't know about something, and I didn't know about the dreadful valley of death. On one side of the valley, you have basic research. On the other side, you have products and sales. And in order for an idea to make it across the valley, researchers and business people have to work together to build a bridge across that valley. And one of the most valuable lessons I learned is that the key ingredients for the idea to get across is that the researchers themselves had to be closely involved. They had to bring their passion, their faith and expertise to the table and engage with business people. If they don't do that, it's almost certain that the idea will die in the valley of death. But when they do get engaged, then magic can happen. And I was very lucky to be involved in one of those big success stories. And it's about a technology that you all have with you today in your pockets or purses. And that's a tiny chip that's in your cell phones that lets you take pictures or the camera on a chip. And did you know that it all started here? A NASA mission to Saturn, named after the famous Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini. That's what's fascinating about basic research. You kind of know where it starts, but you have no idea where we're going to end. Especially nobody saw foresaw that it was going to end up in your cell phones. 
So because of the design of the mission and the requirement that the spacecraft had to be reduced in size, engineers had to come up with breakthrough technologies that enabled the integration of the camera onto the chip with other electronics. And the result was a miniaturized, low-power, low-cost camera on a chip. And the engineers were very enthusiastic about it, and they started disclosing their inventions to us so we can patent them. And further, they went out and they started a new company to commercialize the technology. Fast forward a few years, the entire digital imaging industry has adopted this technology. And because it was so miniaturized, low power, and very cheap, cell phone com companies were able to integrate this chip on your cell phones. And the result is today, everybody, about 3 billion people in the world, every time, everywhere they go at all times, they can take a picture and share with the world. And the societal impact has been tremendous. Look at the explosion of social media. Look at law enforcement in the US. Be able to document the events and, and share with people has been key and has been providing a profound impact. Look at the Arab Spring. Cell phones were responsible to, for taking down two governments and surely be able to document the events with pictures and movies and sharing was key to that. And I don't even mention the great economic activity that was generated by this technology. And I'm convinced that this kind of great success only happened at Caltech because of the culture change I mentioned earlier. That was key to it. And so the question you may ask yourself is, has this culture change diminished the institution in any way? And you have the answer here. For the last five years, Times Higher Education ranked Caltech number one university in the world. So there's that question. The other question you may ask is, has this culture change corrupted researchers to focus on more mundane applied research? Well, this is our 2005 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. His name is Bob Grubbs. And he started at least four companies. So yes, you can be you can reach the highest honor in science and at the same time be deeply involved in commercializing the, your ideas. That's not mutually exclusive. A lot of you here are researchers. And in my opinion, you are doing the most noble and hardest job in the world. You have dedicated your life to the advancement of human knowledge. You're going after the, the most fundamental and hardest questions of nature. And because of that, you hold the seeds of what has the potential to become life-changing technologies. And by lending a little bit more of your energy and passion to the commercialization process, and by extending a hand to people outside science, together, we have the potential to make people's lives better. It's hard, but we can't afford not to do it because when we succeed, we do change the world and for the better. Grazie.